It is a great privilege to have Dr. Ken Thumble provide the next lecture. Ken received his PhD in pharmaceutical science from the University of Washington in 1987 and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in pharmacology at the University of Connecticut. In 1989, he joined the faculty of the University of Washington School of Pharmacy and was promoted to the rank of full professor in 2001. Until a couple of years ago, he was the chairman of the Department of Pharmaceutics. Ken's research interests include elucidating of genetic, hormonal, and environmental factors that contribute to inter-individual differences in xenobiotic biotransformation. Ken is a fellow of AAAS and AAPS and the recipient of the Rawls Palmer Progress in Medicine Award from ASCPT. He is a past president of the American Society of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics. I'm confident you're gonna to enjoy today's lecture. In this lecture, I will introduce um, the, the topic of phase one metabolism and its role in the elimination of pharmacologically active uh, drugs and, and metabolites. I'll also be touching on uh, mechanisms that underlie inter-individual differences in the metabolic processes that contribute to variability in drug efficacy and drug safety, all of, of, of critical importance to the provision of therapeutic uh, um, drug therapy in, in um, the treatment and prevention of disease. First, let's consider this scheme here, which a uh, compartmental uh, model of drug elimination uh, following intravenous as well as oral administration. Following intravenous administration, drug is, of course, uh, introduced into the venous uh, blood system, uh, circulation, uh, travels to the heart and lungs, and then uh, passages into the arterial supply. Arterial blood coming out of the heart perfuses all organs of the body, including those that are, are mediating the pharmacologic effect, as well as the organs of elimination. And the two principal organs of elimination are the kidney and the liver. Drug uh, Blood uh, will distribute drug into both of these organs where it then can be acted on and either metabolized by drug metabolizing enzymes or excreted by, through filtration or transport processes. In the kidney, of course, we have the, the option of filtration. Some drug, of course, can be reabsorbed, but much can be eliminated into the urine. There are also uh, transporters, uh, both on the the, um, the uh, vascular as well as the luminal sides that can facilitate uh, direct excretion of drug into the filtrate. The kidney has very little metabolic activity in terms of the ability to clear drugs. There are some enzymes that are expressed there, but primarily it is, is an organ of drug excretion. In contrast, the liver has both metabolic as well as excre excretory um, activity. Uh, drug partitioning into the liver can undergo metabolism by a variety of enzymes, including the important phase one enzymes. Um, parent drug, of course, can be excreted into the bile, but generally it must undergo some biotransformation uh, first before it ultimately is excreted in, into the bile or back into the blood for elimination through the kidney. Following oral administration, you have those same two organs lead to the elimination of the drug. But in addition, you have contributions of the intestine to the elimination, first pass elimination of drug uh, following its administration into the gut lumen. Drug that, that is, is dosed into the lumen, of course, has to um, be solubilized and then free drug can be partitioned into the intestinal uh, enterocytes. Within the enterocytes, it can undergo metabolism uh, to products that then either may be absorbed into the blood or excreted uh, into the feces, along with any drug that isn't absorbed. Of course, drug has the uh, uh, opportunity to be absorbed into the microvasculature in the intestine. That feeds into the portal vein and then distributes into the liver for another round of potentially first pass elimination. Drug that escapes elimination is absorbed and escapes elimination in the intestine and the liver uh, will, of course, then be delivered via the venous uh, circulation to the heart and then circulating around for another round of systemic uh, elimination processes by the kidney in the liver. 
And so the key distinction between IV and oral dose uh, elimination is the role of the intestine in first pass elimination, as well as the liver in contributing to that first pass loss before drug um, uh, is delivered to the rest of the body to exert its pharmacologic effects. And both drug metabolizing enzymes, in particular phase one enzymes in the intestine and the liver, as well as the transporters, all contribute to the elimination of drug from the body. Thinking then about the relative roles of the intestine and, and, and liver and the um, um, uh, kidney to drug elimination, we can think about then the primary routes of elimination and the contributions of the, the liver as, as, as well as the kidney to the elimination of drugs. And this is a uh, data that was collected uh, a few years back. It's still pretty relevant though, looking at the top 200 drugs um, uh, by prescriptions and the predominant, the major route of elimination of a drug. All drugs are eliminated by multiple processes, but typically one process is going to dominate. And of those top 200 drugs, one can see that the primary predominant route of elimination is through hepatic um, elimination. The kidney uh, contributes to dominates the clearance of about 25% of the drugs, but the majority are going to be eliminated primarily by, by the liver. And within the liver, the predominant route of elimination is through uh, metabolism. That is, you have um, contributions to the biotransformation of drugs by the phase one cytochrome P450 enzymes, which we'll be talking about in great detail, other phase one enzymes, some phase two enzymes, conjugative enzymes. And then in this context here listed as unknown with probably some that involve biliary excretion, direct biliary excretion. Of the drugs that, that are metabolized um, in the liver by the phase one processes, these are principally catalyzed by the cytochrome P450s. And the enzymes that are most important in this phase one biotransformation of drugs are listed down here. The cytochrome P450s 3A dominating um, the, the phase one enzymes, as well as contributions from CYP, uh, 2C9, 2D6, 2C19, and, and 1A2. These are all the principal enzymes involved in phase one metabolism of drugs that are administered by either IV or oral administration. Thinking then about the liver and its role in, in drug elimination and, and considering it as a clearance process, drug of course must be taken up into the hepatocytes and um, uptake into the hepatocytes um, by either passive processes or active transport through, through the, um, if you will, the, the sinusoidal uh, transporter shown here as a, is a phase zero process. Um, this, this categorization of the different processes of hepatic clearance uh, was, was uh, developed a number of years ago. And that phase zero involves the uptake by either passive or active mechanisms. Once in the hepatocyte, um, the drug depicted here as a P for parent molecule typically will undergo some phase one biotransformation. We consider this process of biotransformation to be a functionalization process in that it's, it's basically imparting on the molecule structure that allows it then most often to undergo conjugation by phase two enzymes, such as the UGTs or the sulfotransferases. Drug that then under, has been metabolized to a, a, a primary metabolite and then to a secondary conjugated metabolite will be transported out of the hepatocyte. It is typically too polar to be diffusing across the, the cell membrane and must be transported. And that can either be transported into the bile by the, the catalicular transporters or into back into the, if, across the baselateral membrane for ultimately release into the vasculature um, by other, other um, um, transporters. That excretory process is considered to be phase three or the efflux out of the hepatocyte. And for this particular talk, we're gonna be focusing our attention on the phase one processes, that functionalization, um, if you will, of drugs into metabolites that can either be excreted directly or undergo conjugation to a secondary metabolite for ultimate excretion. 
thinking then about the, the this um, process of hepatic um, um, biotransformation and excretion, we can apply a mathematical concepts to the efficiency of those particular processes. And importantly, thinking about its the contributions of those processes to hepatic clearance, as well as the bioavailability of a drug following oral administration. Depicted here is basically the process of drug absorption um, into from um, an oral delivery in the intestinal lumen into the enterocytes, where it can undergo metabolism by enzymes, particularly phase one and phase two enzymes in the enterocytes for ultimately elimination um, through the feces or absorption into the blood. Unchanged drug that gains access into the portal vein and escapes that first pass metabolism by the enterocytes will passage into the liver and of course undergo metabolism again or basically release into the systemic circulation. And one can define then the fraction of a dose that actually escapes, is absorbed and escapes first pass uh, elimination in both the enterocytes and the liver by this mathematical relationship, where that fraction or the bioavailability observed is, is equal to the area under the curves of the concentration time profiles following oral administration over intravenous administration times the relative doses that are administered. From a the, the availability perspective, that availability observed is equal to the products of three different terms. The fraction of a dose that is actually absorbed into the enterocytes, the fraction that escapes uh, first pass metabolism, FG, in the enterocytes, and then the fraction that escapes uh, hepatic metabolism or excretion in the liver. And for each of these organs, in particular the liver, one can define that availability as simply one minus the extraction ratio that, um, of the, the dose that is delivered into the organ and that um, um, undergoes elimination. Thinking about each organ, in particular the liver, one can define the clearance of that uh, metabolic clearance and total clearance of the, of the uh, uh, liver enzymes and excretory transporters with this relationship here. Clearance is assumed to be the sum of individual processes that are acting on drug within the enterocyte. All those processes are assumed to operate in parallel and thus the clearance terms are, are additive. Within the hepatocyte then, um, within the, the considering the total body clearance, here, the total body clearance is equal to the sum of those clearances within the liver, um, as well as the, the, the clearance in the kidney by the kidney, and then clearance potentially by any other um, organ of the, of the body, these being the two principal clearance organs. Considering the liver clearance, that hepatic clearance, one can define um, the efficiency of that process by this relationship here, where you have drug being delivered into the liver via either the portal vein or the hepatic artery and eliminated by um, the hepatic vein for distribution into the, to, the vet, to the venous circulation and the rest of the body. Within the liver, metabolism and secretion can occur. And that clearance, that efficiency of the elimination in the, by the liver is equal to the product of the extraction ratio times the blood flow going into that organ. And that can be further defined by this relationship as the product of hepatic blood flow times the product of the fraction unbound and the unbound intrinsic clearance um, for the elimination process. And that term there, that product is divided by the sum of blood flow plus that same uh, product of the fraction unbound and the unbound intrinsic clearance. The ultimate efficiency of elimination then is defined by both blood flow as well as the efficiency, the intrinsic clearance of either the metabolic enzymes or the secretory enzymes. In this lecture, we're gonna be focusing our intention on the metabolic enzymes, the metabolic processes that are catalyzed by phase one enzymes. The intrinsic clearance, that unbound intrinsic clearance within the liver, the total unbound intrinsic clearance is simply the sum of the individual intrinsic clearances for each metabolic process, each enzyme that is catalyzing the elimination of, of drugs.
And for each of those enzymes, one can further express them in terms of their michaelis menten um, um, constants shown here, Vmax over the KM, assuming non-saturable kinetics. And that total intrinsic clearance is simply the sum of the individual intrinsic clearances associated with each enzyme that can catalyze the elimination of the drug. And for each of those intrinsic clearance, they can be further broken down uh, the Vmax term as the product of the total enzyme pool times the KCAT for that elimination process divided by its KM. So the total intrinsic clearance is simply then the sum of these michaelis metan re, um, ratios, constant ratios for each metabolic or secretory process. And so within the liver, then there are multiple enzymes and some of those, maybe only one, maybe two, maybe three, will be involved in the, the biotransformation of a drug that is presented into that organ. The enzymes that are available for metabolism are, are, are quite um, um, uh, large. There are multiple different enzymes. The phase one enzymes being the dominant ones and the cytochrome P450s being the dominant phase uh, one enzymes. The liver though contains other drug metabolizing enzymes. In fact, almost all of the enzymes that are found in the human body can be found in significant concentrations within the liver. A few exceptions, CYP1A1, an enzyme that is expressed predominantly extrahepatically, um, as well as a couple of the UGTs that are found only within the intestinal enterocytes. The intestine has a considerable array of, of drug metabolizing enzymes, including these phase one enzymes up here, the cytochrome P450s. However, the dominant form that is expressed in the intestine is the CYP3A form, CYP3A4 and CYP3A5, with a little bit of contributions from the 2C forms, 2C9 and 2C19. Other enzymes are expressed only uh, weakly, except perhaps CYP1A1, which can be expressed in significant levels following um, exposure to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are typically found in cigarettes of smoke. So cigarette smoking can induce CYP1A1 in the intestine. The other enzymes that are found within the intestine are the UGTs, um, several of the form, major forms of the UGT1A family, as well as two, the 2B family. And of course, other conjugating enzymes, the sulfotransferases, glutathione S transferases, the NATs, and the important carboxylesterases, which act on prodrugs that then must be hydrolyzed to release active molecules that then are delivered to the body for their pharmacologic effects. Thinking then about each uh, cell and, and the uh, localization of these uh, phase one enzymes within the enterocyte or the hepatocyte, um, one can um, look at this particular illustration here to, to um, identify within the, the cell the organelles in which these enzymes are concentrated. And for the cytochrome P450s, as well as, as FMO and other phase two enzymes, these are predominantly localized within the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum, of course, is also referred to as the microsomal fraction. Um, this is a, a um, basically sphericals of the ER that are formed following uh, disruption of the cell membrane on isolation. Um, those microsomes contain the P450s as well as um, FMO and some of the carboxylesterases and even some of the conjugating enzymes such as UGTs. The other site of drug metabolizing enzymes is the cytosol, basically the aqueous environment that sits, um, um, that, that, that perfuses the entire um, in, intracellular domain. And within the cytosol, you have other phase one enzymes like aldehyde oxidase, but also conjugating enzymes like the sulfur transferases and the N-acetyl transferases. Mitochondria typically doesn't have drug metabolizing enzymes, um, I'm sorry, shown here. And, but um, what is found in there is the, the monoamine oxidases, which is sometimes involved in drug metabolism, but, but infrequently. The predominant um, bulk, um, um, bulk of the drug metabolizing activity is going to be catalyzed by the cytochrome P450s, and those are found within the, the endoplasmic reticulum fraction. 
So let's say some more about the cytochrome P450, since that is the major route of, of drug metabolism for drugs that are administered uh, to patients. It is a part of the cytochrome P450s are a super family of gene products. There are 57 of these in, in humans. The highest concentrations of the cytochrome P450s in general, total concentrations, are found within the liver. However, if one thinks about specific forms, say, such as CYP3A4, one can find um, equivalent levels, equivalent concentrations of that particular um, P450 isoform in both the liver and the small intestine. The name cytochrome P450 is derived from a unique absorption um, spectrum, a different spectrum, um, following um, at the reduction, one electron reduction of the iron in the, in the hemoprotein of the P450 and complexation with carbon monoxide. It gives a, a maximum at 450 nanometers um, and a minimum at about 420 nanometers. This um, characteristic absorption difference spectra um, actually reflects the abundance of the P450, the P, if you will, the difference between 450 and 400 nanometers um, is, is proportional to the concentration of the P450s that are forming this particular complex. The function of the P450 um, is defined by its localization in the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, it sits on top of the membrane, anchored um, by an N-terminus, um, um, shown depicted here in this helix here. But the majority of the enzyme actually sits on top of the ER membrane facing the cytosol. And therefore, drug can access that particular enzyme in, in one of two ways. The dominant way for most Lipophilic drugs that are given orally is actually partitioning into the membrane and then accessing uh, the active site, the iron of the heme protein through this substrate access channel. Uh, once biotransformed by the enzyme um, in, in the active site, the product then will egress um, basically through a, an, an aqueous channel and then released into the cytosol for further disposition. The function of this, this heme protein here is, is um, requires essential contributions from the cytochrome P450 reductase, CPR, which is an NADPH-dependent um, coenzyme that basically delivers electrons from NADPH to the cytochrome P450 heme iron um, and to, to catalyze the biotransformation of xenobiotics. So let's say some things then about those biotransformation reactions. The cytochrome P450s can catalyze a, a wide variety of oxidation reactions, but typically these are oxidations that are occurring on carbon, um, but you can catalyze the oxidations of, of other uh, molecules, nitrogen and oxygen um, and sulfur as well. Considering then the biotransformation um, of molecules, um, such as dextromethorphan shown here, cytochrome P450s will catalyze an oxidation of the um, carbon adjacent to a heteroatom, such as nitrogen and oxygen. Um, that hydroxylation reaction, once it occurs, results in spontaneous release of, of in this case here, formaldehyde, releasing the free amine um, um, of the dextromethorphan molecule. Cytochrome P450-3A4, and this is predominant enzyme catalyzing this particular ND alkylation reaction. Another P450, CYP2D6, catalyzes an O demethylation reaction that is initiated by oxidation of the alpha carbon adjacent to the oxygen atom. These ND alkylation and O dealkylation reactions are very commonly found for many drugs that are um, therapeutic agents that are used to treat diseases. Another common type of oxidation reaction that P450 enzymes can catalyze is the, the hydroxylation of aromatic molecules, typically in the pair position to the substitution. So one can see as shown here in the parahydroxylation of, of diphenylhydantoin or phenytoin, uh, a reaction that is catalyzed predominantly by CYP2C9 with a little bit of contribution from CYP2C19.
Again, aromatic hydroxylation is a very common um, type of biotransformation reaction. In this particular example here with phenytoin pair hydroxylation, it illustrates the regioselectivity, that is the para position, it's the preferred site of hydroxylation, and then it generates a, a chiral metabolite here as a result of stereoselective um, biotransformation. The enzymes, uh, cytochrome P450s in, in found within the liver um, have been studied extensively over the, the last uh, three to four decades. And it has resulted in a compilation of uh, an identification of molecules that are selective or diagnostic substrates, as well as inhibitors of the key P450 enzymes that are involved in drug biotransformation. These diagnostic substrates and inhibitors are powerful tools for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, in their attempt to characterize both the disposition of their particular new molecular entity, as well as its potential to cause drug-drug interactions. And these diagnostic substrates and inhibitors are used to first characterize the contribution of different P450s to the metabolic elimination of a new molecular entity by selective inhibition of individual isoforms in a say um, um, system that includes all of the P450s of, of importance. Say for example, human hepatocytes or human liver microsomes. So each of these inhibitors can be used to identify the contribution of a different form to the metabolic elimination of a new molecular entity. The diagnostic substrates shown here, some such as S-warfarin for 2C9, midazolam for 3A4, dextromethorphan, which we just talked about for 2D6, can be used to identify whether the new molecular entity has the propensity to cause a drug interaction, either inhibition of these individual cytochrome P450 forms or in fact, induction of those cytochrome P450 forms. So these diagnostic substrates and inhibitors of the P450s, again, are powerful tools for the characterization of both the metabolism as well as the ability to cause drug interactions of new molecular entities. I want to say a few things about P450 uh, taxonomy, um, the, the nomenclature rules, um, so that there's an understanding of how the different uh, isoforms were, were described. When describing any P450 gene product, say 2D6, for example, the SIP designates that it's a cytochrome P450. Um, the first Ar Arabic um, numeral here identifies or designates the P450 family in which it is found. And then the capital letter that follows designates the subfamily. And finally, the last numeral here distinguishes the individual gene product um, within a particular subfamily. Now, classification within families and subfamilies um, is, is based on amino acid sequence homology. How similar are two P450 isoforms um, amino acid sequence to each other? P450 uh, sequences that are, are greater than 40% are going to be found uh, within a given family. If they're less than 40%, then they're going to be placed into different families. Um, so it's possible that a P450 could end up within a unique family all by itself if it were any had no similarity to another. The drug metabolizing P450s in humans are all found within multi-gene uh, families um, and subfamilies. Classification within a subfamily is based on um, a homology that is greater than 55% um, identity. And within this particular subfamily of the human P450s, it can range from that, that limit of 56% to, as, to as, as great as 98% uh, amino acid sequence homology. And so they can have very, very cl close similarity or less similarity uh, based on those amino acid sequence. Finally, when thinking about the, the fact that there are genetic variations within all the drug metabolizing enzymes, including the cytochrome P450s, those individual allylic variants are designated by the star um, depicted here following the last numeral, and then a, a numeral that indicates the particular allele for that particular um, um, enzyme or gene product. 
In this instance here, CYP2D6, a common genetic variant, is the STAR4 variant, which results in loss of, of function of the P450 enzyme. Saying some things about where the P450s that catalyze drug metabolism um, in the liver fit within the full com compendium of cytochrome P450s. Um, the three families that are involved in drug metabolism, one, two, three, um, are shown here, but most of the cytochrome P450s in the human body actually catalyze the, the same types of oxidation reactions, but of endogenous substrates, fatty acids, vitamins, bile acids, as well as steroids. So most of the P450s in humans are involved in these endogenous biotransformation, which have important um, um, cellular functions in maintaining hemostasis, or homeostasis rather, and these three here are those that are involved in biotransformation of xenobiotics, including drugs. Each of the enzymes that are involved in drug metabolizing, including the cytochrome P450s, um, exhibit significant inter-individual variability in terms of the abundance of those enzymes within an individual's um, liver or small intestine. That is basically a, a characteristic of all the drug metabolizing enzymes is this tremendous inter-individual variability. That variability is, is a consequence of two factors. A major source of it is the, the regulation of the genes that encode the P450 proteins. Um, this involves both constitutive processes that is regulation by molecules such as, as um, steroids, um, um, even uh, growth hormone, other hormones throughout the body, which exert effects through modifying the activity of transcription factors and, and gene transcription. Um, the abundance of these enzymes, drug metabolizing enzymes, can also be influenced by xenobiotics, which exert their effects often through um, activation of various transcription factors. Variability in the abundance of drug metabolizing enzymes can also um, be exhibited by post-transcriptional mechanisms, particularly the involvement of microRNA, which influences the translation process. And then less well understood is epigenetic phenomena, such as methylation, which can also regulate um, gene transcription processes. And finally, um, there can be um, um, variability in the, the protein clearance processes, principally by proteasomal as, as well as lysosomal mediated uh, protein degradation. And then lastly, of course, we have genetic variation, which affects both the synthesis of an enzyme as well as its degradation, which both can also contribute to variability in enzyme abundance. I wanted to show this example of the variability in enzyme abundance is with a major hepatic enzyme, CYP2C9. This is data collected from a combined liver bank at the University of Washington, as well as St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Depicted here is basically the frequency of different abundances of CYP2C9 protein um, expressed here as picomoles per milligram of microsomal protein quantified by an LCMSMS method. And you can see here it is distributed in a somewhat unimodal skewed um, pattern. But important to understand is the quite variable um, um, differences in the abundance of this particular single uh, P450 enzyme in human livers, ranging in this study from 1.4 to as high as 99 picomoles per milligram, over 60-fold uh, variability in the abundance of this single P450 amongst different human livers. And if this were then translated in vivo, one would expect then the potential for high variability in the clearance metabolic clearance of drugs eliminated predominantly by CYP2C9. And that is what is illustrated here. This is data that was published in Roland and Tozer derived from an earlier uh, publication depicting the relationship between daily dose of this drug phenytoin, which undergoes parahydroxylation by CYP2C9, and the plasma phenytoin concentration, trough concentration, achieved following multiple dose administration. So this is essentially a steady state concentration following a constant fixed dose that varied from one patient to the next based on other um, and algorithms that considered um, other factors, demographic factors as well, um, 
as, as concomitant medications. And one can see here that the, um, uh, there is a dose, if you will, concentration, steady state concentration relationship leads to higher systemic uh, blood levels of phenytoin. But what, what should be appreciated is the fact that at any given dose depicted with this dotted line here, there's tremendous inter-individual variability, inter-patient variability in the blood level achieved with the same dose administered uh, um, by, by multiple dose administration to a patient. So that variability then is, of course, a problem for um, um, the clinician because in this context here, uh, the, the um, safety and efficacy of phenytoin is defined by a narrow therapeutic window of concentrations between uh, 10 and 20 milligram per liter here. And this requires then individualization of the dosing of phenytoin to take into consideration this significant inter-individual variability in the dose concentration relationship. Now, what drives this variability? Well, clearly in the case of phenytoin, nonlinear kinetics contributes to it. It's a, it's a, um, a drug that can saturate the, the CYP2C9 uh, enzyme and leading to a more hyperbolic relationship between the um, concentration um, and, and clearance process. But also contributing to this is, of course, going to be genetic, as well as environmental factors that will affect that hepatic um, CYP2C9 uh, content. And so then thinking about the metabolism and excretion of phenytoin, it's fairly straightforward. Again, here, the controlling factor, though, is CYP2C9. It catalyzes the, this initial parahydroxylation, leading to the inactivation of phenytoin. And so the pharmacology of phenytoin is controlled by CYP2C9 and the inter-individual differences in its abundance and its catalytic activity. Secondarily, there is conjugation by the UGT enzymes, a, a common um, process leading to this conjugate here, highly polar conjugate that then can be excreted out of the hepatocyte by MRP3. So Thinking then um, um, in greater detail about those mechanisms of inter-individual variability, this is a nice illustration pointing out that that variability will be dependent on the genetic constitution, what form of the gene um, is, is, is present in any given patient, what variants um, are present, and how do they affect both the abundance of the enzyme as well as its ability to catalyze biotransformation reactions. In addition, our Mitigating factors um, such as the age of the individual patient, the sex for females, are they pregnant or not? Is there an infection? Is there inflammation, a cytokine releases that can influence gene expression? Even things like circadian rhythms throughout the day can influence the transcription of, of genes into their protein products. And of course, the function of the liver, um, is, it, is, it, is it dysfunctional or is it a normal function? And then of course, the administration of xenobiotics, um, um, drugs that can influence both the transcription as well as the function of a, 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 an enzyme of biotransformation and other factors, even diet itself can influence the, the, the expression of, of uh, genes into their gene products. All of these factors, as well as the genetic constitution, contribute to those inter-individual differences that were um, um, illustrated in the uh, phenytoin um, dose um, steady state concentration relationship. Thinking a little bit more about how genetic variation influences um, both the, the production of the protein as well as its function. Um, we consider the fact that for any given gene, it's, it's a, um, defined by the presence of both exons, which are basically the coding regions of the gene, um, uh, defined by codons for specific um, amino acids as well as introns. In this case here, a simplistic view of three, a gene with three exons and two introns. In addition, there are flanking regions, both at the three prime region, as well as the five prime region. This particular gene then can be transcribed by polymerases. Uh, those polymerases will, will generate uh, heteronuclear RNA, which contains both the um, sequences for both the exons as well as the introns. 
that heteroRNA is then uh, undergoes splicing by the spliceosome to convert it into a mature RNA, which now um, um, basically encodes the particular protein and that translation in the ribosome. Proteins may or may not involve post-translational modification. The cytochrome P450s, a key step here is the incorporation of the heme to make the enzyme um, fully functional. Um, variation in the sequence here of a particular gene at any site can influence both the production of the protein as well as its function as a biotransformation enzyme. And those variants can do so by changing both the structure of the protein that is produced, as well as the rate of synthesis. Uh, the rate of synthesis is controlled primarily in the five prime region by domains referred to as promoters and enhancer. These domains basically respond or, or have an affinity for transcription factors found within the nucleus. Those transcription factors are activated by circulating molecules um, either, either hormones or, or xenobiotic molecules, other regulatory molecules that bind to transcription factors and then um, associate with both enhancer and promoter regions and drive the, trans the binding of the polymerase and the transcription to a heteroRNA. There is also epigenetic loci that are regulated by methylation that can provide an overarching um, regulation of gene transcription. So genetic variation within these regions of the gene can also contribute to variability in the transcription process. Lastly, we also consider variation at the three prime N, in particular the three prime UTR, that is basically the binding domain for microRNA. MicroRNA are produced in all cells, including um, the hepatocytes, and those microRNA, the transcription, the production of them is dependent on environmental factors. And therefore, variability in the environment can influence the production of my, microRNA. And they basically influence the translation efficiency of this mature RNA into the protein products. So these are all mechanisms by which you can have both environmental factors as well as genetic variability influencing both the abundance of a protein and its function. And to illustrate then some of that genetic variation um, shown here is basically the structure of CYP2C9, which we've introduced, and some of the common uh, variants, the amino acid substitutions, coding variants that are found within the human population. Multiple different variants have been identified at key amino acids depicted here. So the two uh, common ones that are, are described and well described are substitutions at the 144 position in arginine, as well as substitution of, of the isoleucine at 359. These two variants lead to changes in the efficiency of CYP2C9 in metabolizing phenytoin as well as other substrates for the enzyme. The STAR2 variant exerts its effect primarily by influencing the interaction between the P450 and the P450 reductase, re increasing the KD, reducing that affinity, lowering the Vmax of that reaction, and lowering the intrinsic clearance. Over here, the STAR3 variant has two effects. It, 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 it affects the affinity of the substrate for the enzyme, increasing the KM. It also leads to a lower Vmax and again, resulting in a lower intrinsic clearance. That reduced intrinsic clearance is, of course, then going to potentially influence the elimination, the metabolism of elimination of substrates for 2C9. Two substrates commonly used, diagnostic substrates, phenytoin and the production of this product here, parahydroxy uh, uh, phenytoin, as well as warfarin. S-warfarin and the 7-hydroxy um, um, hydroxylation, both catalyzed predominantly by CYP2C9. This is data that was collected from basically an experiment with recombinantly expressed forms of the cytochrome P450, the reference form, the STAR1 allele, the STAR2 allele, as well as the STAR3 allele and those coding substitutions. And for both phenytoin and warfarin, S-warfarin, the metabolism of these substrates is altered in the, um, um, the gene products uh, from the STAR2 uh, gene variant as well as the STAR3, influencing both the KM and the Vmax. 
For phenytoin here, you can see the STAR2 um, causes a reduction in both in the VMAX, no change in the KM, whereas the STAR3 um, um, it results in a reduction in the VMAX and an increase in the KM. Thus, the intrinsic relative to the reference form is reduced uh, for both the STAR2 and the STAR3 variant, with the STAR3 having the most deleterious effects because of the change in both KM and VMAX. You can see similar changes in the intrinsic clearance towards warfarin through the 7-hydroxylation reaction. So this is the type of, of alteration in the intrinsic clearance of substrates of, of CYP2C9 that can be found within the human population because of genetic variation. There are many other variants that are found in, in the human population. Some that have been well studied shown here also lead to similar reductions in both the metabolism of both phenytoin as well as, as warfarin. Even novel variants found in, in, in work that we conducted with the Alaska native population also showing reduced activity. So genetic variation can be a major source then of inter-individual differences in systemic concentrations following multiple dose administration. And that's illustrated here in this concentration time profile for phenytoin in individuals who had been prior uh, characterization of their genotype. The concentration time profile of the reference um, um, star one, star one genotype is shown here. And then for individuals carrying either one variant, either star two or star three, or two uh, variants, um, either being homozygous star two, star two, or heterozygous star two, star three, are depicted here. And what should be apparent then is the, the uh, consequence of genetic variation is an increase in the systemic concentrations and the AUC of, of phenytoin following oral administration. And this variability then can lead to differences, of course, in the safety and efficacy and necess necessitate changes in dosing to um, basically um, to, to take into consideration the slower clearance of phenytoin in these individual patients. And that is the type of inter-individual variability then that contributes to the variability in, in drug safety and, and efficacy. Another form of inter-individual variability that is important to understand is that involving drug-drug interactions. I, in this case here, I'm illustrating it with the, the major P450, CYP3A4, an enzyme that is very sensitive to drug-drug interactions, both induction by agents such as rifampin, as well as inhibition by agents such as ketoconazole. Um, the data that I'm illustrating here is with the drug simvastatin, a, 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 a drug used to, to lower um, blood cholesterol levels. It is a sensitive 3A substrate in the sense that, that there are profound changes in um, its systemic exposure following co-administration of both inducers of the predominant enzyme that catalyzes it elimination, 3A4, as well as inhibitors. And looking then at the concentration time profile for simvastatin under control conditions here, the circles, dark circles, you can see the effects of co-administration with both rifampin, shown down here, as well as the inhibitor ketoconazole. Thinking first about induction, what you see is co-administration of rifampin leads to over a 90% reduction in the systemic concentration of simvastatin. Um, that major reduction in systemic exposure basically leads to a loss of efficacy. In contrast, co-administration with an inhibitor of CYP3A4 leads to a marked increase in the systemic concentrations of, of simvastatin, resulting in increased risk for adverse side effects such as myopathies. That profound change in the disposition of simvastatin is a consequence of the fact that it is um, the interactions can occur both in the intestine as well as in the liver. And both um, um, interactions there influence the availability of that sensitive substrate simvastatin um, following oral administration. And that is a consequence of the fact that simvastatin has a very high intrinsic clearance catalyzed by CYP3A enzymes. 
Not all CYP3A enzymes um, ex exhibit this high uh, intrinsic clearance and high first pass elimination in the, the gut and the liver. And that's depicted by looking at the effects of inhibition by ketoconazole on three benzodiazepines, midazolam, triazolam, and alprazolam. Medaz moderate extraction ratio drug it has a relatively high intrinsic clearance, and there is, is first pass elimination in both the liver as well as the, the gastrointestinal mucosa. In contrast, alprazolam has a low extraction ra ratio um, in, in both the gut as well as the liver, a low intrinsic clearance, but its elimination is, is controlled by the same enzyme as midazolam CYP3A4. And therefore, the effects of ketoconazole are different. You get, of course, for both substrates of 3A4, an increase in the AUC following co-administration with ketoconazole for both midazolam as well as alprazolam. But what is different is the effect on first-pass elimination. In the case of midazolam, ketoconazole can basically um, reduce the extraction ratio uh, both in the liver as well as the gut and lead to an increase in the bioavailability of midazolam from 30% up to almost 100%. And that results in not only the, the, the extension of the half-life of the drug as a result of the reduction in systemic clearance, but a profound increase in the Cmax as a result of the increase in the bioavailability of midazolam. And therefore, if you look at the area under the curve uh, in, with, with co-administration of, of, of midazolam and ketoconazole compared to the control, you see 15-fold changes in that ratio. In contrast for midazolam, it's a very modest one-and-a-half-fold increase in the AUC following ketoconazole administration. So that's an important um, um, observation. Um, and basically uh, illustrates the importance of understanding the, the sensitivity of a particular drug to biotransformation by CYP3A, as well as is it the dominant route of elimination. Another um, um, aspect of, of, of uh, variability that can be found within the population is variability that is a con consequence of age. Um, age, in fact, um, has an impact on the abundance as well as the activity of the drug metabolizing enzymes illustrated here in looking at the cytochrome P450 activity. The most profound changes happen early in life. Most of the hepatic drug metabolizing enzymes are actually turned off in the fetus during fetal development, and they're triggered and turned on at birth probably by epigenetic phenomena. However, the time course of expression varies from form to form and as a function of age. And this variability, this age-dependent change in, in P450 activity is referred to as the ontogeny, that is the ontogenic development of this trait here relative to the adult trait here. And so this is data that was uh, part of a meta-analysis of diagnostic substrates for the different P450 forms um, that have been studied in the pediatric population and looking at the fraction of that activity as a function of the adult. And shown here then is, is the, for the individual forms, the fraction of activity starting from very low to negligible at birth, increasing for some forms very, very rapidly for other forms, uh, more slowly, um, and even very slowly in the case of CYP2E1 here. So differences in the time course driven by pre pre presumably differences in the regulation of the hepatic P450 as a function of age contribute to this ontogenic, if you will, profile for the different P450 forms. And of course, this is a very important from therapeutic perspective of understanding this time course when thinking about how to dose drugs that are predominantly eliminated by one P450 form or another. Another important source of variability um, in drug metabolizing act activity that impinges on both drug safety and efficacy are the changes that can occur in pregnancy. Um, pregnancy is, is a very uh, profound um, um, state in a woman involving, of course, many changes that are, that are, are uh, mediated for um, the development of the fetus. 
But there are also changes that occur that influence the disposition of a drug. A few of them are illustrated here, changes that can affect gastric emptying, um, cardiac output, the extracellular fluid space that drug can distribute into, even the fat compartment that drug can distribute into. For drug addiction, obviously it's the changes that happen in the kidney that are important, influencing renal clearance. And then in the context of this talk here, it's the changes in P450 um, as well as UGT activity that can occur in the, in the liver during pregnancy. And that's illustrated here with, with a substrate, a diagnostic substrate of CYP3A, um, midazolam. Um, the studies that have been conducted typically because pregnancy is, is unpredictable by comparing the disposition of a probe drug like midazolam during pregnancy, illustrated here in, the, in this concentration time profile, and comparing it to the postpartum period where the baby has, has, has been delivered. And then presumably the woman's um, liver uh, function and regulation is returning to a baseline. And what's shown here is the increase in midazolam that occurs uh, following parturition and, and um, with lower AEC following a fixed dose of midazolam during the pregnancy period. This, of course, then implies that there's a, an increase in the, the um, midazolam oral clearance or CL over the bioavailability of midazolam. And that, has, that increase has been attributed to an upregulation of P453A by hormones uh, um, released during pregnancy, in particular progesterone, as well as potentially placental-derived uh, fetal growth hormone. There are many other changes that occur for other P450s during pregnancy um, that, that are also as profound. And there are some P450 activities that are actually decreased during, during pregnancy. Finally, just a few things about um, um, other sources of inter-individual variability um, um, during uh, drug therapy. Of course, one needs to think about the function of the liver itself. Um, and the, the impact that liver disease can have on those metabolic activities. As um, healthy functional tissue in the liver is replaced as a consequence of, of disease, in particular during the most severe stages of cirrhosis, you generally will see a reduction in the abundance of liver enzymes, as well as their, their um, activity, their intrinsic activity. And this leads then to reduced ability to eliminate drugs um, by the liver. There are also reductions in the functional blood flow to the, those, um, the, the healthy hepatocytes that remain in liver disease, and that also contributes to a reduction in clearance. Other changes that can influence the disposition include changes in protein binding. The disposition of both oral and as well as parenteral or IV um, doses of both low and high extraction drugs are going to be influenced by liver disease. Of course, the, the degree to which those activities are affected is a consequence of the severity of the, of the liver disease itself. Depicted here is, is, is basically the clearance catalyzed by um, um, different cytochrome P450s towards probe substrates of those enzymes with increasing severity of liver dysfunction to the point of either hepatic decompensation or the most severe hepatic renal syndrome, which will lead to death. And what you can see here is that all P450s decline as a consequence of these decrease in hepatic function, but they do so at a different rate. CYP2C19 seems to be the most sensitive to early changes in hepatic function with mild liver disease, um, whereas others like CYP2E1 uh, are basically somewhat resistant and only decline in function with the very, very end stages of liver, liver um, disease. Others fall in between to varying degrees. And so it's important then to understand that the, the, the change in, in the, the metabolic activity that is going to occur as a consequence of, of decreased liver function, but also that the time course is going to vary depending on which enzyme you're, is, is catalyzing the clearance of a particular substrate. And so, and finally, then summarizing this introduction to phase one metabolism. Um, first, that, that phase one metabolism is the predominant route of drug clearance um, and, and first pass elimination, um, contributing to the, the elimination of a majority of the drugs that are, are on the therapeutic, uh, are on the market today for the treatment of disease. 
Those enzymes are localized primarily in the liver and the small intestine, um, both contributing to first pass elimination. And of course the liver contributing predominantly to the, the elimination following um, um, uh, of drug in the systemic circulation. The P450s are the dominant uh, phase one enzymes. Um, there are multiple forms of cytochrome P450s like drug elimination. They have um, in significant uh, differences in abundance, both in the liver and the intestine. And that's a consequence of both genetic factors as well as um, um, age, sex, um, and transformations during the life cycle. And then of course, disease. Lastly, there are a variety of, of exogenous sources of, of, of inter-individual variability that can affect both the abundance of a, of a drug metabolizing enzyme and, and its intrinsic activity. Um, in particular, enzyme inhibitors and inducers with CYP3A4 being the most sensitive of the cytochrome P450s to these effects because of the, of the, the fact that it's expressed in both the liver and the small intestine and for sensitive substrates can contribute to extensive first pass metabolism. But there are a lot of other factors that contribute to that variability, even th things as simple as light, light uh, dark cycles, and, and diurnal variation, even solar cycles that influence um, the abundance of, of molecules such as vitamin D that regulates um, cytochrome P450s like 3A4. And lastly, uh, a not well understood uh, domain of epigenetic changes that are happen as a consequence of the life cycle, as well as it, it, the effects of uh, foreign molecules and, and disease states on um, the expression of the, the drug metabolizing enzymes. And so with that, I wanna conclude this presentation and introduction to um, um, the phase one metabolism of drugs and xenobiotics. Thank you.